Yeah, I think we're set. Um, so yeah, uh, really excited to have everybody here uh, for our, I think, third virtual meetup. Uh, the past two have been really fun and uh, really neat to connect with people outside of the New York City area. So hoping to do more of these. Um, a couple quick sort of news and announcements we have before then moving on to the actual uh, focus for today. Um, one is anybody who's interested in the policy side of DERs, we have sort of a breakout group who's working together to comment on um, a docket in Connecticut right now on energy storage and interconnection and AMI. Um, that's being led by Kyle Haas, who's uh, one, one of the uh, regular members here. Um, if that interests you, there's a meeting on uh, Friday, um, at noon to start discussing that. And um, I sent everybody who's a subscriber to the newsletter uh, meeting invite. If you um, haven't, um, if you haven't subscribed though, and if you're not on the Slack where it was also posted, uh, just let me know in some way and I'll get you an invite to that. Um, also just subscribe, that's the way to go. Um, so that, that should be fun. That should be a cool little experiment to see how we kind of pull the resources of the community to, to comment on things like that. A second fun little announcement is um, we have uh, brought on Nicole. Nicole's on kind of the main organizing team now, helping out with all of our communication and everything. Um, I work with Nicole regularly and a bunch of you have in the past. Um, so that's super exciting. Um, and then James, do we have anything else? Any other updates? Um, I would just kind of tack on that, um, you know, in, in relation to, uh, the policy initiative that was actually a, a member of the group, Kyle, uh, came forward and said, Hey, we should all comment on, on this docket, these dockets together in Connecticut. So, um, you know, it's like a new initiative that's being actively shaped. So anyone within policy or, or who's interested in policy, um, that working group is, is sort of, um, you know, it's like a burgeoning piece of this all, you know, we've gone from just the meetups to the meetups and presentations to the podcast, to the Slack. And, and so we're kind of always evolving and whether it's on the policy front or anything else, like, you know, Nicole kind of coming in and helping with community outreach. Um, uh, we're always looking for, for more kind of active, uh, contribution. Uh, to the community on the, on the policy front or otherwise. So please, um, you know, ping any one of us on, on uh, Twitter, email, Slack, whatever it may be, uh, if you kind of have some ideas or thoughts on, on places we could take the, the community. So, and, and Duncan, I think, did you, did you mention the Slack or? Um, yeah, I guess I just sort of threw it in there, but yeah, we do. So we did throw, uh, together a Slack. Um, you go to the website, the join link is right right on the home page. Uh, there's a bunch of cool stuff happening in there from working on this little policy project in Connecticut to people posting jobs, looking for partners on projects, stuff like that. Um, it's, uh, I think we have, I'll, I'll check right now, but I think we launched it a couple days ago and have like 70 something, 70 something folks on it. Uh, let's see. Well, it's not telling me, but it, it's grown quickly <laughs> and it would be awesome. We're at 79, so. 79, awesome. It'd be, it'd be great if everybody else who's interested in that sort of thing joined as well. Um, otherwise, so today we have a pretty cool presentation in store. Um, Faye with Wood McKenzie, who is a pretty regular uh, meetup attendee, or at least uh, when it was in person, always was. Um, is going to be talking to us today about building electrification. And I think generally, right, this is a really fascinating topic that we've spent zero time on so far. We're very like electricity and electricity markets focused. Um, and this is uh, super vital, right, to climate um, and is gonna have a huge impact on the energy profile of buildings um, if we're able to pull it off. I also think a lot of folks here are New York City specific, where I think this is like a particularly And we have a couple people on the call um, who you know, spend a lot of time working on this. 
Um, so I'm hoping you guys speak up during this and kind of voice your opinions and, and questions. Um, some really quick logistics then. For the past two meetups, the way we've been kind of making this work um, is if everybody can just go on mute. Um, if you have a question or something you want to say during phase presentation, um, throw it up in the chat. Uh, we find just doing it over Zoom in real time like we normally do in person, it's just kind of messy. So put it in the chat and then one of the organizers will try to project at the right time when it might fit into phase presentation. If we don't get to it, we'll try to get to it at the end, at which point we'll just call on you and let you voice your own question. Um, yeah, otherwise, I, I think, I mean, I think we're all set. Um, Faye, if you wanna take it away. Sure, thanks, Duncan, thanks, James. Um, hi, everyone. I'm gonna quickly share my screen so I can get this started. Do you have some slides to go through? All right, let me know if you can see it. Yep, I can see Good. it. Okay, awesome, yeah. So just a little bit about myself. I was kind of scrolling through the two screens and I don't know if I broke the record. I'm gonna guess no, because you know, <laughs> the other one was probably really popular. Um, but uh, I, like Duncan said, I attended the, the meetup pretty often. I feel like the names, I, I definitely met some of you and some of you are, I think we interact on Twitter. And so it's kind of nice to see everyone's name, so thanks for being here. Um, my name is Fei Wang, and I am the research manager of the Grid Edge team at Wood McKenzie Power Renewables. Um, came, came in through kind of the acquisition of Green Tech Media, GTM Research. So I'm not gonna go into the history behind it, it's gonna take some time, but just knowing that we're, I'm still working in the market research group that focuses on Grid Edge topics, which covers anything relating to distribution of electricity towards the customer side. And my research area focuses on customer energy management. So I look at how utilities are engaging with customers through different programs and how customer side resources contribute to um, grid flexibility. And before Will McKinsey GTM, I was an energy consultant with ICF for about five years looking at how environmental regulations, especially on the federal side, impact the generation portfolio in North America and worked on multiple regulations and how you know, with utility clients, how they would impact their generation portfolio up to about 2016. Um, after many regulations I was working on have been pull pulled back or slowed down, decided it's time to switch over to the distributed energy resources side, hence uh, kind of jumping over all the way from modeling bulk generation to looking at customer choices and customer energy management programs. So that's just a little bit of my background. And for the last few months, um, a couple of months ago, my coworker, Ben Gallagher and I, some of you are very familiar with, um, worked on a report together, particularly looking at what it means to electrify space heating in residential and commercial settings. And that kind of led me into looking at more what it means to, you know, have more building electrification and especially in the US, how that would impact um, our grid planning, which is something that I, look at, but I feel like people have been talking a lot about electric vehicles, people have been talking a lot about um, just in general distributed energy resources installations, but buildings being a huge part of this haven't really received a lot of attention. So I'm very glad to hear there are a lot, some people on the call today, a lot of experience, so please speak up and ask questions. Um, because for me, this is really the start of a topic I'm very interested in. So without further ado, let's get started. There we go. So I figured it would be maybe helpful to look at the big picture first. So this is from uh, EIA based on the latest data they can publish 2019 in terms of energy consumption. It's a little overwhelming. I think you will get the slides later to dig into it a bit more. So on the left side, you have the sources in terms of 
different types of whether it's fossil fuel or renewables and some of that goes into power generation then it travels into different end use sectors um, EIA always sees the entire energy consumption space by residential commercial industrial and transportation and we can see that transportation does take up quite a bit of energy consumption in the US and rightfully so EV is getting a lot of attention but what we're looking at here is that in the residential and commercial sector, the two sources that really matter, one is natural gas and one is electricity. They're kind of head to head for both residential and commercial usage. So, and when we're looking at this type of trend um, and we're, it, it's really just seeing the competition between electricity and natural gas kind of going forward. And together, residential and commercial space take up about 28% of an um, used energy consumption. I think if you're reading some recently published articles about building electrification, you will see this figure like 40% of energy end use comes from residential and commercial buildings. I think that's because they actually consider the electrical system energy losses, the, the very dark part at the bottom that you're seeing there. So once you consider that, it brings it up to about 40%. Um, sometimes these figures get thrown around a lot. So I did a little bit of chasing around uh, earlier and trying to figure out how, what, what, where they exactly came up with this number. So I think this is, this is where it's usually published and um, kind of the base we're working from. And when we look at commercial and residential kind of end uses. And the reason why we are saying building electrification is important is to look at what is actually what the energy where the energy actually goes to. And especially in the residential sector, space heating, water heating, and space cooling make up about almost 60% of total energy use. And that's a huge chunk. The space cooling part is pretty much all electrified as point, but when it comes to space heating and water heating, there's still a lot of direct combustion of natural gas in both residential and commercial buildings. That's one reason because it is one of the most visible, two of the most visible areas for consumption. The other reason is because for both space heating, space cooling, and also water heating, there is a huge potential for actually providing flexibility from these resources to grid operations. I think that's another reason why the focus when it comes to building electrification is focuses on residential and commercial, especially space heating and water heating areas. Um, and I just wanna say electrified heating uh, in particular, it's not, it's not green hydrogen. It's already very common in the US. And this is from the EIA Residential Energy Consumption Survey, which is a little bit dated. So that even proves more the case that this, this is not something that people are not using, but it is quite divided by different regions. So the left corner at the bottom shows you kind of different climate defined by EIA. And there is the breakdown of different fuels used in electrifying space heating specific, uh, sorry, space heating specifically. And we can see in areas that's like hot and humid, um, you can see more electrified heating being available. But in area in regions, which is almost half of the country in terms of area, the cold and very cold climate, natural gas still plays a much larger role than electricity. And they also have fuel oil in the mix, which is the most polluting and probably the oldest infrastructure and very ripe for opportunities to switch to other fuels. Um, so that's something that's already going on. And for today's presentation, I think I'm gonna spend some time looking at space heating. Then we're gonna spend a little bit of time on water heating as well. And lastly, I'm gonna talk a little bit about cooking. I know it's not controllable. It's not going to be uh, contributing in flexibility because you can't tell people when or when not to cook, um, as we all know from the past few months especially. But, um, but it is usually the last mile of completely decarbonizing household or buildings. Um, so, so we'll go with that. 
So this is the part I'm actually most nervous about before we start, I was telling James and Duncan. Um, when you look at actual technologies that can help electrifying residential and commercial buildings, especially when it comes to space heating, um, it's, it really comes down to heat pumps. There's, you can say there's space for heating, there is electric resistance, but when you look at actual commercial, av commercially available technologies as well as energy efficiency levels, heat pumps are definitely the most efficient and the best choice out of the bunch. Um, and then again, just to emphasize, it's already commercially available. And the left picture here kind of shows how a heat pump works. I'm going to attempt to explain it. So essentially, you see two coils on this chart, on this picture here. And the left side indicates a coil sitting in a colder area. Let's call it outside. Let's assume this is a heating situation. And the right coil is in a warmer area. So to start, there is a refrigerant sitting in the first coil, which is being evaporated at low pressure by and in the process absorbing ambient heat, ambient heat outside. And then this refrigerant gets moved across the process to going up and being uh, through this compressor at, at high pressure. And in this process, the heat will be released and in the indoor area in this case. Then after that, the refrigerant, the refrigerant goes through the expansion valve, kind of goes back to the state where it was, back to the first coil, ready to start the process again. So as you can see, the heat pump doesn't really produce heat per se. It absorbs heat from elsewhere and transfer it from one area to the other. So the cooling process can be the same. So this technology has been applied for decades now, if not more. It's used in your refrigerator, it's used in your window AC unit if you're in New York City, or any air conditioner for, um, cooling technology for that matter. So that's not something you need to develop more. There is one area that's being um, that's a little bit challenging is that when temperature drops, the, the colder it gets, the performance level of some older heat pumps might not perform as well and the efficiency level might decrease. But I think I read a Rocky Mountain Institute report recently that um, talks about that kind of, there is more technology development on that side and there is available heat pump technology that actually performs well in cold climates. So that, Technology, technological hurdle that's being conquered at, um, as time goes on. So because, it's a, because a heat pump uses electricity and it also absorbs ambient uh, heat from ambient air, so you're, when you're looking at the table on the right side, which I took from both DOE's uh, website as well as Energy Star's requirements for energy efficient appliances. In terms of actual, uh, to achieve a certain level of heat output and how much input it actually needs to achieve that level, the air source heat pumps are way more efficient. So right here, um, I think it's probably easy to understand in terms of the boilers and furnaces, the, to be considered an inefficient appliance, the level still is less than 100% because there will be losses. But for air source heat pumps, the COP um, stands for coefficient of performance, which is a ratio between uh, with heat, uh, heat output over electricity input, but converted to common energy units. Mm -hmm. So that's almost at least two to three times more efficient than other heating technologies. So there's no question in you know, which one is the most efficient. And when I talk to other people also interested in this topic, especially if they come from a natural gas background, one of the questions they always ask is, what, even if you use electricity, natural gas is still being used by, uh, to generate power, so how do you I'm sure people who work on EV get this annoying question all the time. But I think for to answer this question, one is if you're using natural gas, a boiler or a furnace, you're directly combusting a fossil fuel. And if you're looking at gener generation portfolio, yes, it does vary and we're not decarbonized yet. Um, but in a lot of, a lot of 
instances is better than directly combusting 100% fossil fuel. On the other hand, you also don't need as much input to actually reach or achieve a certain level of heat output. So both those things together, um, and we're expecting our sector to continue to decarbonize. So this point, having an elect Electric, having electric heating is definitely more efficient and um, more decarbonized than as an option than uh, any natural gas options out there. So just to be completely uh, direct here. Um, so with high efficiency and the benefit of decarbonization, so why are people not adopting this because we're still seeing a lot of natural gas in the in, in play. I think the reason is one, natural gas is quite cheap. And to switch to a heat pump and electric system does take quite a bit of capital um, investment upfront, especially for customers. So I'm showing this chart here. Um, that it's it's really an illustration for how much incentives there needs to be for customers to find it economically viable if that is the only consideration in terms of long-term savings um, and long-term economic benefits if that's that's the only consideration that's how much in incentives it needs to kind of flip the mpv level so um, on the left side the y-axis that's the mpv level uh, at the bottom we're basically increasing the level of incentives for heat pumps. So the ones you see that are going up, the lighter blue one is air source heat pumps and the darker navy blue one is geothermal ground source um, heat pumps. And the two uh, in the middle, the green one is fuel oil and the yellow one is natural gas furnace. So just to, in terms of capital costs, upfront costs at, at, um, at the beginning, ground source heat pumps are definitely way more expensive and air source heat pumps are more compared to ground source. And in terms of switching, you do need quite a few thousand dollars to actually switch that MPV as an illustration. And the assumptions we used here is one is um, average fuel prices, average electricity prices. We picked a house in New York State and also, we're assuming about, it's a pretty sizable house, like 2,000 2, square feet or so. Um, the reason why I picked New York is because in January, New York State actually came out with a, an energy efficiency and an electrification order. Um, by March, all the investor-owned utilities filed a joint implementation plan to push for more heat pump installations in New York State. So... Um, we picked New York State because of that there, there is something that's happening and the utilities are actually focusing on heat pump programs focused on heat instead of cooling programs for the first time. And yeah, so, so this does show you do need some incentives and the real decision is really between natural gas and electricity. That will be, that will be requiring more incentives if you're switching from fuel oil, um, the incentives are actually do not require that much. And that's one interesting thing, especially um, in New York, as well as a larger New England area, um, because a lot of the houses that are switching, uh, doing fuel switching actually are switching off fuel oil. So this region is at a crossroads, whether you're switching to natural gas or you're switching to electricity, um, I think that's something policies have to be involved to make sure we're making a decision that's that's more decarbonized and that's better for the future. Um, just to echo what James and Duncan said up top, you know, there is a, this community has is doing more policy initiatives, and that's something that's going to be very key. And I'm going to show examples later about how what kind of hurdles for electrification that um, this industry is already running into. And so I talked about one type of policy, which is um, providing incentives for customers to switch uh, f different fuels. Another one is 
based on local government policies. So municipalities, city governments, they can actually issue ordinances or um, issue or decide on building codes that require you know, all electric infrastructure for new construction, or they require a certain level of retrofits. Um, there are other options as well. You know, the, they can make it optional, they can make it mandatory, they can also just have a ban on, you cannot hook up additional natural gas in new construction anymore. So on the left side, I'm showing all these green dots. I made this chart in March. So, um, so all the, there are th I believe there are 30 dots there representing 30 cities, towns, municipalities in California that have already adopted some kind of um, building codes that encourage all electric construction um, or any type of elect pro-electrification building codes. And that has been progressing really fast because the first one out of all of it, Berkeley, actually did it summer of 2019. So it really has start, um, started spreading very quickly. And we also saw uh, towns like Brookline, uh, Massachusetts, and Cambridge, Massachusetts also considering similar types of policy changes. And when you have a long list of cities and towns that are adopting this type of building codes, um, I'm also seeing states already kind of taking this preemptive action to ban the natural gas ban. So this, these are the six states on the right side that I've highlighted. Arizona has already passed a piece of legislation that basically bans their municipalities and local governments from actually uh, issuing any kind of natural gas bans. And the other five states have introduced bills in their state legislature. Um, but Arizona is the only one that actually signed into law so far. Yep. And another question I also get and slash wondered about as I was looking at this topic is that if we get a lot more heat pumps on our electric grid system, how, how much more electricity do they need to consume? And also how much more capacity in terms of uh, distribution, infrastructure, generation, we need to actually supply to satisfy this additional demand. And the answer so far is that utilities are way more concerned about electric vehicles and they're actually not so concerned about buildings so far, especially when it comes to heating, because most of regions are summer peaking. And even when winter demand is going up, they, it, it, it's probably not going to reach that level. They might be really concerned at the moment. But the real answer is also they don't really know yet, because not many utilities have embarked on this journey to really study if there is active Space heating electrification, what it means to our distribution operation and how much demand is going to increase. The only um, kind of figures I saw included in uh, this is Sacramento Municipal Utility District SMUD's um, IRP from Integrated Resource Planning uh, report from 2019 is that they are expecting about 365 gigawatt hour of additional energy consumption in 2030 from building electrification, but the increase from vehicles, from transportation electrification is about three times of that. So that's kind of the concern that utilities are facing and they're um, forecasting just in SMUD's case. And the other study I've seen, that's what I'm showing on the screen right now, is ISO New England for the first time in 2020 when they were conducting their demand forecast, they looked at the plans for different states that their system covers, how many more uh, you know, heat pumps are there gonna be in the system and what it means to, for each heat pump, how much more capacity do they need on the system? And if you look at the chart on the right, so they looked at you know, the data without, they, they targeted this one particular area in Massachusetts where households have switched from um, fuel oil to heat pumps uh, and how much more electricity demand there is. So they did 
the, the result is about 0 0.3 kilowatt to one kilowatt, depending on the household. But if you look at the assumptions and what went into this result, you actually only saw, you saw that they're relying on advanced in, metering infrastructure data, but only from 18 households. So that is a really tiny sample of households. Um, but they're using that as a starting point and they do have plans to expand that analysis and forecast, forecast for future studies. Um, but it is the first time they are including heat, heat electrification into their um, demand forecasting, which is a encouraging sign. But again, this is the only system operator I've seen that conducted this type of study so far. And so we talked a lot, quite a bit about um, space heating. So I want to sw switch gears a little bit and talk about water heating. So the two charts I'm showing on the screen right now, they're from a demonstration project that um, tries to show the technological benefit of CTA 2045, which is a communication protocol, industrial design change that would require electric water heaters to have embedded um, functions that would allow utilities to control um, water heater demand. So uh, this is something this is something that was developed almost 10 years ago. It has been talked about in pretty much every piece of home energy management report I have seen, I have writ written about it in my own reports, um, but it hasn't really been adopted by many factors until, um, until the uh, last year when Washington State actually said all the electric water heaters, electric storage water heaters that are sold in Washington State starting in 2021 and 2022, depending on the type, will have to have this uh, protocol, um, CTA 2045 standard embedded in the design. So if you're familiar with rule 21 on the solar side, um, the requirement for advanced and smart inverters, um, it, start, it also started with just two states requiring it and all the, man, all the manufacturers are basically saying, well, it doesn't make sense for us to make different types of uh, devices for different markets within one country. So basically once a couple of states required it, the entire market became equipped with this advanced equipment. I think the similar thing is also going to happen probably a little more slowly, but with water heaters as well. Because if you look at water heater sales, it doesn't really change because people don't go out and it usually, it's usually when you encounter a huge problem, then you go buy a new water heater, then you think about what you need to buy. So the sales are quite stable throughout the years, about 4 million in terms of um, in terms of electric water heaters in the US for the last six, seven years. And, but because of this appliance ch standards change, um, I think we're going to see more available, efficient and grid interactive water heaters um, in the market. And I think the thing here, uh, thing here is also, if you look at you know, the navy blue versus the lighter version of the blue. The one is heat pump water heaters, that's the darker one, and the other one's electric uh, resistance water heaters. And I think one thing I think we can all agree is that if we switch to a heat pump water heater, it's just going to be more efficient. And it's not, it's not going to provide as much flexibility to the system. And that's something that have that came up in some discussions with utilities with um, kind of heat pumps for space heating, space cooling as well. Um, for example, for SMUD, they had quite a um, they had quite a successful electrification program, and the way they did it is to actually expand from their existing energy efficiency program. Instead of asking for a new initiative, they just included additional appliances into their energy efficiency program, and provided um, provided rebates and it became very successful as a program. And when I was talking to them about, you know, are you concerned about additional demand from, uh, in terms of electricity, uh, grid constraints, and they're like, well, for, especially when it comes to heat pump, um, air source heat pumps, if you replace an efficient unit with an old one, you actually will see a decrease if you just look at 
building energy consumption when it comes to space heating and space cooling. And in winter, yes, see a little bit of increase from heating, but you will not see that increase to overtake the summer peak. So you're actually using the system more efficiently because of it, you're just using it more, uh, you're, you're optimizing it more in different seasons. So that's something uh, this demonstration project has also shown is just the efficiency level of heat pump appliances. And when you run a program, even though it is not as much, there's still value in using these inter grid interactive resources. And we're expecting to see that being more available because of changes, again, when it comes to regulations and policies to actually push the manufacturers, the business to adopt this type of changes that would actually ripple through the entire country. So I actually want to end with cooking. Um, I saw an article last week um, from Mother Jones, I believe, talking about how the natural gas industry actually has been paying Instagram influencers to post about hashtag cooking with gas. So I was intrigued. I'm sure the algorithm has got me already. They're going to push a lot of this type of post to me from now on. Um, but yeah, that's something they started running around like end of 2018. And there's still recent posts as well. Um, I, I do think cooking is something that's interesting because I would talk to someone that's very interested in electrifying their homes but in the end they will say the dirty little secret is that i haven't got rid of my gas stove or that's something i'm not willing to let go um, like i said earlier this is not a source of controlled flexibility for grid and it would never be but it is the last mile it is something if you want to completely electrify at home this needs to change um, I think it comes down to a couple of reasons. One is that people are not really familiar with the more efficient technology that's available on the market right now um, that you can actually take advantage of like induction cook stoves and things like that. And people are feel very emotional about gas stoves, to be honest. And, and I think you can see on the left side, it took some semi screenshots of these different posts from American Gas Associ Association, which represents pretty much all the gas utilities. Um, they are running this campaign and kind of trying to take advantage of this emotional connection you have with your gas stoves. And, and I have also talked to utilities in areas where gas is very cheap and they want to, you know, run a, a building electrification program. And they're basically saying we are expecting um, we're, we're expecting, you know, gas lobbyists and advocates to definitely fight us um, in this battle. But at the same time, um, on the right side, this is a screenshot I took from Southern California at Edison, which is an electric utility and only provides electric services and also is leading a 200 million program in California focused on building electrification for the next few years. And this is something they have been doing for a while, which is to make sure customers are familiar with this type of technology. So you can rent a induction unit for free and you can try it before you want to buy it. And I think it's really about education and changing in some ways the culture in this in, in this very small steps. Um, but I also just want to say Faye, I think you were muted by accident. Yes. <laughs> That's right. I heard it. So um, but yeah, this is towards the end. So um, I do think it's interesting to see because I cover a lot of electric electricity utilities and um, for a while I don't think I needed to read upon what gas utilities are doing and because of this one particular particular to topic I have found myself reading more and more about gas utilities strategies and how they intertwine with each other and the New York order I mentioned earlier I think it will be really interesting to see because, for example, National Grid provides only gas services in, for example, Brooklyn, but they do have electric services in other regions in New York State. And how 
nat the National Grid Gas Services are going to work with, say, the Con Edison part that provides electricity services for those customers. That would be interesting. Um, and I'm also seeing once this building electrification discussion starts, as I went through some of the dockets and regulatory filings, you can see gas utilities pretty much have all the same talking points about renewable natural gas, which is essentially biogas methane, um, talk about um, hydrogen using existing infrastructure for new pilots. They're also talking about um, maybe using that infrastructure for some of the geothermal applications as well. So I, I do think this is something that utilities are not talking about or to, maybe they are talking to each other, but not in public. Um, but that is something to watch out for. And I, and, and I think for, again, coming back to the first slide, um, where we we're showing the different you know, energy consumption in residential and commercial spaces, it's really, it really comes down to electricity and natural gas kind of going head to head. And for a long time, the electric service provider and gas service provider can pretty much coexist. And I think this is kind of going to intensify that relationship. Um, yeah, I'm happy to do an update in, in a little bit to see <laughs> how things have progressed. But I just want to end it here and see if anyone has questions. Awesome. Thanks, Faye. Um, I think there's, there's a bunch of questions. They're all uh, very in the weeds. So this should be interesting. I'm just going to scroll to the top and sort of locate the first person with something interesting here. Um, well, so James, you had a question about the cost curve or learning rate of, for heat pumps. Do you want to voice that? Yeah, so, um, and obviously is, uh, this is your first time, like we, you know, usually it's not just the, the presenter like call and response, you know, if there's someone out there who works really directly with heat pumps kind of on the ground and less on the research side, like please feel free to jump in. I'm sure Faye will, will, will be all right with it too in, in certain cases, but um, yeah, I had a question because like usually when you think of, you know, incentives going to solar or wind, or batteries now we've watched those cost curves come down very very fast to the point where um you know many in the solar industry are saying uh we we don't need the incentives anymore and we'll, we'll be fine on our own um and so you know whether it's just like the underlying technology or almost similarly in in um in solar with like balance of system costs or soft costs and in, like install costs uh cost of customer acquisition you know whatever it may be um, when looking at those um, kind of incentive graphs, like I'm wondering if, you know, because I don't know anything about it, is is the kind of mainstream uh, thought here that he's, heat pumps cost curves will come down enough to um, to actually beat or compete with boilers or, or or anything else over time, or is that is it more like um, you know the the other benefits, whether it's flexibility or or from a climate change perspective, like there, there's kind of, you know, those incentives will have to stay over a, a longer period of time and, and they're, they're not really going to get cost competitive with, with the uh, whatever systems are um, they're competing against currently. Yeah, I, I have to say, I'm, uh, please, if someone else uh, knows more about this, please speak up. Uh, but like I mentioned, um, this technology is quite mature and commercially available for a while now. So I, I'm gonna, I'm gonna just guess here. Like it's probably not going to come down substantially. And you're right. I didn't even mention the benefits when it comes to, um, you know, indoor air quality or other health benefits that having electrified system would actually bring. And again, that the the chart I showed. Uh, maybe I should pull it up again. But it's really purely on economics, and yeah. Did, is anyone here, anyone else here has more insights? To I think share? I saw Stephen uh, respond. If uh, oh yeah, okay. Stephen, go ahead. Actually, or sorry, yeah. Colleen. Yeah, you too. <laughs> should I should I go first or yes? Yeah. So I mean, in, in the in the chat, I response re responded to soft costs. And I think that's very relevant for the installation side, but 
I guess I want to note that the NPV is both CapEx as well as OpEx, right? And the OpEx here in this case is fuel, electricity, et cetera. Um, if we're just comparing on a like today's prices basis, um, you know, you'll see what you see, but in states where you have strong climate laws in place where you have to decarbonize the system, we're not talking about electrifying, we're talking about decarbonizing gas. And there are plenty of studies out there that'll, that'll show um, RNG is not in huge supply. And if we are talking about decarbonizing gas, that the cost of gas is going to go up. So um, we have to consider that as well when we're, when we're talking about comparing the costs for electricity versus gas in the long run. Yep. Yeah, and I was gonna sort of go on like a, a similar realm, which is I think specific municipal laws will start talking about pricing differently. So in, in New York State, right, there's local law 97, which is requiring everyone to sort of step down in their energy usage. And I, my understanding of that is there's also sort of a carbon intensity built in. And as the grid greens and gas doesn't, that sort of like penalty that you might pay could be factored into your actual payback. So I think there are different ways that we'll sort of see the opportunity cost maybe change, even if like, it's just because we're starting to price carbon into the equation. Cool. Um, there was another interesting question from Justin on um, sort of greenhouse gases and refrigerants. And if we switch from one refrigerant to another, what, what are the impacts there? Justin, would, would you want to voice that? Yeah, sure. Um, my understanding is that changing the refrigerant that you use in an air source heat pump potentially has design implications as well as efficiency and cost implications. This is very much a, a sort of worry for the future. Like right now, uh, the, the climate forcing implications of using very slightly leaky air source heat pumps are much lower than you know using them to replace gas alternatives but eventually uh, it's something to worry about potentially and so is it your understanding Faye that that is meaningful to the economic profile of heat pumps this this need to eventually swap out your refrigerants for something that doesn't have a, a spectacular climate forcing number mm. I have to be completely honest. That's not something I looked at. Um, yeah, sorry. I don't. I don't think I can say anything intelligent here uh, regarding that. Um, anyone else uh, familiar with the more technical aspects of heat pumps can help out here. It would be great. I just actually spoke with someone at a company recently that um, their whole focus is building. Uh, basically like window, easy to install window heat pumps with uh, refrigerants that um, address that issue, Justin. Um, I think they're like a startup in San Francisco. I'll, I'll post the name of it in Slack, but I, I uh, you know, it was the first I've heard of like a real commercial effort to, um, you know, address that, which I thought was pretty cool. Um, so if anyone's like interested in that, I'll, I'll post it in Slack and you can check it out. Um, one comment, the refrigerant swap out's an important piece, but and like a long-term piece, but there there is a lot of near-term research being done by EPRI and many others around lower global warming potential refrigerants. So it's definitely happening. And in due time, that worry will become less in the, the main, the, in the initial piece, but the replacement still remains once we get these heat pumps in. Just want to address one comment about uh, from Colleen about Sola from Bon Appetit using an induction cook stove. I almost included a picture of her in the presentation today. <laughs> she's the best. <laughs> and she's promoting electrification. It's great. Yep. <laughs> Let's see. There's an interesting one from um, Ethan about. ISO New England and, and gas constraints. Ethan, you wanna um, you wanna ask that? Yeah, sure. So so this is um, one of the interesting things. If you dig into the hourly um, CO two uh, 
impact of electricity in New England is that mostly you've got gas on the margins until you get into the very coldest part of the winter and then there's not enough natural gas to supply the heating needs for buildings as well as the grid. And so the grid starts to switch back to oil and, you know, some really dirtiest generators, right? And so my question is, if we put in all these heat pumps in the Northeast where the biggest load is going to be winter mornings and or, or depending on how they're set up, um, what does that do to the, the grid mix? And can we can we do better than that, right? Are we going to be putting the electric building an electric peak right when we've already got the dirtiest generators going on the grid or because of the much higher efficiency are we actually decreasing um, the the total demand on natural gas more than we're increasing the electric side so that the net co2 impact is still better like is it critical that we figure out how to shift the peak with weatherization or are we making progress with everyone even if we just do them without controls yeah, that's, um, I, I do think that's probably the, the, the prompt for ISO New England to actually start including that heat pump additional installation piece into their demand forecast and to actually figure out when that is happening and how they're modeling um, based on the bulk generation they have and uh, just the interaction between, I guess, in and demand because they're, they are concerned about in the transmission um, infrastructure that's, that's in place. And I don't think we have, I, I haven't, and again, the, the one system operator or utility that's really far ahead, the two I mentioned, one is SMUD, one is ISO New England to actually have this type of analysis out um, for an actual system outside of you know, any kind of research, um, I guess, environment, we're not, we're not there yet. I don't think people have figured that out. And at least based on my conversations with utilities that have heat pump programs, um, when, I, when it comes to the question about, okay, so you have, you're focused on customer acquisition or customer installations, you're trying to hit a target. Um, a lot of these orders do come with funding as well as number of heat pumps they need to install by a certain time. So they're trying to hit that. But when a question comes to, is this related to your distribution planning team? Is this related to your resource planning team or your operations team to actually figure out, is, is that going to be a pressure for you? Um, so far, the answers I have heard are pretty much, we're not there yet. We, we're, we're trying to focus one step at a time, trying to get heat pumps there first. But I think that's basically you know in the head like it's it's a really key question i don't i don't think anyone's there to figure out in the real um setting yet so can, can i follow up then with a with a comment back to that because mm -hmm. um the irp that's in process right now for burlington vermont mm -hmm. uh which has a municipal electric system um and i don't know that they've put any of this up publicly but i got invited to be one of the, the citizen participants <laughs> on their irp um, so i've been uh rabble rousing in there and they're showing this enormous peak from from winter heating because they're responding to the mayor's initiative to go carbon neutral by either 2020 or 2030 they've done both scenarios out there so the electric department in their current irp is planning out what that looks like. And it basically doubles the, the capacity required to run the electric grid for Burlington. And so the question I keep asking is looking at like how narrow and spiky those peaks are is how much money could you put into weatherizing? Like you're assuming that we're already putting heat pumps into most of the homes, like 80% of the homes, all the businesses. Yeah, there's a little bit of district heat with the wood chip, you know, electric plant on the edge of town, but mostly we're shifting a ton of heat onto electricity how much could we spend on weatherization to drop that peak down and be ahead of the game for what we're going to have to spend on all of the infrastructure costs in town? So when that IRP comes out, they're going to have a whole bunch of numbers on what it looks like to switch everything to heat pumps. I think the, the, the other tricky thing about this peak question is often when those studies are done, they... Uh, they assume that uh, at those peak times, the heat pumps backup resistance heating is going to be kicking in, which, you know, halves or, or worse, is, worse than halves the COP 
And so you suddenly see like a peak within the peak, right? <laughs> um, and I think there's questions about maybe in Burlington that's necessary. I'm not sure based on the weather, but there's questions about, you know, if, if we're really using the best, most modern refrigerants, all that stuff, is backup resistance really going to be a factor? Um, and I don't know the answer to that. Yeah, I think the weatherization comment is a good one. I know at least in New York State, the heat pump conversations have been focused on holistic building, like whether that will happen or not when installs start happening, um, we'll see. But there is this idea that you should be doing building shell with heat pumps at the same time in order to like reduce the sizing of the heat pump that you have to install because it also reduces the cost of the heat pump because you can have a smaller heat pump and like there's sort of in theory like cascading benefits to doing weatherization at the install rather than later because then now you have an oversized heat pump in the home. Yeah and I, I guess with the electrification discussion not just building but um, because a lot of times the um, if you look at these building codes passed by California municipalities, they actually also have a component for electric vehicle charging as well. A lot of times um, they, they want to make sure that infrastructure is, is there too. And with that, I think one of my questions, I don't think this has been answered by anyone yet, it's it, you need to also think about what types of distributed generation and storage that needs to go with these electrification efforts. Because if you're just relying on um, the bulk generation electric grid to decarbonize, which is expected to happen, but that also would require additional transmission um, infrastructure to actually you know, deliver the commodity. Um, but it, that's something I feel like it's also missing so far from a lot of the uh, electrification initiatives. Um, I guess it's it's not at the scale that you need to worry about large scale distribution generation and storage yet, but I, I think it's going to come up at some point, especially considering the coordination with EV charging that's going to be in these buildings as well. So I had a question kind of related to that actually, like did um, you know, have you seen anything about sort of um, the early or, or or maybe not success of these programs uh, in the states that they're that they're being tried? Because I think one interesting point that's maybe you know I'd love for you to expand on is is like the, what we're hinting at now is that the whole timing aspect to this, right? So I think I was in one of the Con Ed like um, uh, kind of. Uh, working groups or like uh, webinars about this. And uh, they're like some very high percentage of boilers and these things are, are actually expected to come off line in the next five years or be changed. And you're putting in like a 25 year asset when you change those boilers. So if we don't get some adoption rate, like within the next five years, we actually have no hope of like hitting the goals by 2050 or whatever it may be. So um, there is this sense of urgency maybe in, 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 that isn't there with like weatherization that when you ex install a boiler instead of a heat pump, you're making like a 25 year decision. So um, did, did you um, like maybe if, if you could like expand on, um, you know, kind of that aspect, like how, how are the adoption rates look like, are these programs being successful? Um, what is, wh what's like the outlook, I guess, going, going further, uh, going forward? Um, yes. So in terms of it, the timing is definitely, I think that's very common in a lot of energy efficiency initiatives because of the, you know, equipment, whatever you decide to install, it does have quite a long lifetime and you don't want to. And, and I think that's particularly why it's interesting in New England and New York because the, the region is at a crossroads and you kind of have to, um, and so it's encouraging to see New York State having that order and all the IOUs have a target to follow through. Um, same thing with, I think New England, it's more at Massachusetts and Maine both have really high targets. In terms of existing programs, I guess the one, a lot of the, I guess heat pump programs traditionally focus more on cooling. And when it comes to heating, the one I, again, I'm going to bring up um, smart again. I think they are they are successful for a couple of reasons. One is because um, 
instead of rewarding this type of initiative based on energy consumption or energy savings, like a more traditional approach of evaluating energy efficiency programs, um, it, they decided to evaluate and reward programs to, for carbon, re, carbon emissions reduction. So that really changes the incentives in terms of what types of equipment you actually put in. Um, I think SMUT was the first one that did this and from an energy efficiency program perspective. And the California uh, other IOUs are um, kind of follow suit uh, recently. Um, and another thing that changed in California is also the energy efficiency uh, funding that wasn't allowed for electrification projects until about a year, year and a half ago. Um, because when that standard was created, the grid was a lot dirtier than what it is right now. So now they're realizing, okay, we can actually switch this. Um, but they did run into, um, I think we can also expect this for a lot of other utilities as well, um, especially the municipal utilities because of funding constraints that we can expect starting at least like this year and going forward. Um, and that's where a lot of the rebates come from um, and a lot of the incentives come from. So it, it, in terms of running into issues, I think having the consistent availability of rebates is key. And just because of the current, um, especially with uh, cars, you can't really go in and install things um, because of sheltering place orders. And because of the economic crisis and the uh, recession that's coming uh, already here, I, I think that's going to cause a lot of issues um, in terms of carrying through um, a lot of these initiatives. But then again, it's uh, the programs are, I think, oh, another thing interesting about SMUD is that when they were calculating the, um, when they're calculating the benefits, they, it's not kind of like a blanket, I guess, um, you know, a couple hundred dollars per ton of cooling capability. I, I'm sure I got that technical term wrong, but it's, it, it's, it's more based on, because for them, it's also beneficial to be able to sell more electricity. So they had some sort of calculation going in to determine the rebate level. So it's also beneficial, uh, add the beneficial level to the utility as well. Um, so I thought that was like a couple of really interesting things that came out of that program and um, probably have implications for other programs as well. I see, I see a hand up there, Duncan. I don't know if you were going to ask a question, but that wasn't intentional. But I, I do have a question. Um, no, 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 Joey. Joey put his hand up in the screen. I did. Oh, really? I did. Okay. Hey, Joey. What's up? Hey, ask away. Um. So, Faye, really, really good presentation. Um. I just wanted to make some comments in New York City market. Um. From the perspective of landlords, with my customers. Um. Air source heat pumps can theoretically work for multifamily buildings. I don't think anyone argues that. Um, I think everyone's aware of the distribution level issues related to converting steam buildings to hydronic loops or putting individual air source heat pumps for each unit outside the exterior of the building, outside each unit. Um, there is a couple things that I want to mention, which is the amount of space or energy density um, that is lost going from a boiler to an air source heat pump. So, you know, Manhattan buildings are very tight in general and their basements are even tighter. And as it is, these boiler rooms are small and these boilers are packed into these rooms. Um, hypothetically, even if the incentives do come out for New York City, not just for a per ton, not just for the units, but also for the distribution side work, which I hope, I hope they're smart enough to do. Um, you also need roughly, by my calculations, and I might be wrong here, back in the envelope, about four times the space to equal one, you know, one boiler plant for an air source heat pump, which means the landlord now needs to give up storage space in the basement that they might have a storage room or an amenity like a gym. So there's additional factors from the customer's perspective, at least from the landlord perspective of a multifamily building in New York City that I think regulators, I hope, 
pay attention to when designing incentives for this eventual transition, whenever, whenever it happens. Hmm. Yeah, super interesting. Yeah, I didn't, thanks. Thanks for sharing that. Yeah, that is really interesting. I always think about, yeah, in New York City, you have the steam issue, you have the spark spread being much crazier than most places, which hurts heat pumps. Never thought about space. That's, that's very fascinating. That's a theme with batteries too, by the way. I've heard people like, we did the math and, and it, you know, it's a luxury building. So it's <laughs> the bike room we make more money off of than, uh, than actually installing uh, this fancy battery. <laughs> so um, it depends on the building, obviously, but it's, it's, it's pretty interesting. Pretty much all the new construction buildings are putting them on the roof now. That's pretty kind of the standard. So you know, probably see more of that, but obviously with existing buildings, yeah, how do you run the, the lines down to the individual apartments? It's going to be a challenge. We got to be like Hong Kong. Like, I feel like the side of Hong Kong buildings are just like have all these little yeah. heat pumps like hanging out on the side of the wall. <laughs> yeah, that works in any, any non-historic district, maybe. Or, yeah, so. <laughs> Does any you're allowed three feet to from the building they like made that exception for awnings so as long as they can keep them you know under that it's possible sorry duncan go ahead i was going to ask if if anyone here has experience with like commercial sized heat pumps uh, whether multifamily or like other types of commercial buildings it just seems to be a a sector within the electrification conversation that doesn't get a lot of love um but is I think challenging in ways, and I'd just be interested if anyone's uh, seen any of these larger, you know, heat pumps or installed any. Yeah, I mean, usually they're at, they're, they're smaller and they're distributed, I think, you know, I don't think sure. there's like massive, massive units. Um, I think they just put a lot of them. That's been yeah, my yeah, yeah. In new construction, yeah, you, lot of, you see a lot of the like smaller VRF stuff all over the place. Um, but like, I'm making this up, but like half the buildings in Manhattan have a giant boiler in the basement. Um, yeah. And yeah, I'm, I'm interested. I know like Stanford University um, replaced their, uh, their hot water, like district heating system with like a enormous heat pump. Um, and I just wonder if that's happening elsewhere, if that was kind of like a science project. I've never seen one. People are trying, but I think to your point, replacing steam systems or like, you know, one pipe steam, two pipe steam and multifamily um, is complicated and adds a lot of like different types of expense. I think some of the interesting things, that, things to think about are how you could, speaking about space, like in theory, you can give customers more square footage if you were actually to be able to remove this piping because you could take out radiators and you're putting in things on the wall. So there's like some potential for increased value in apartment space by like moving heat pumps and heating systems more exterior. But it's, it's difficult. I think continuing down the New York City specific path, um, the owner, the building owners are paying for the heating. And, you know, if it's, if it's rent stabilizer, you know, you know, more more kind of extreme than that then they're re like required to pay for the heating so it's challenging i think for them to make that switch but when they're not rent stabilized i think more than like 50 percent of the buildings are not rent stabilized it can put that cost on the consumer and so it can actually take that cost off of them and then renters aren't thinking about the cost of the heat pump or they're not thinking of the cost of the utilities they're just looking at the sticker price of the apartment's cost so you know every new renovated building that I like apartment that I've lived in has had heat pumps for that exact reason. That's a fun uh, question for the group is the externality behavioral of uh, switching to heat pumps. If customers have to pay for their heat, they'll, they'll use it. Less. <laughs> but it's way, be it's way better too. You yeah. know, heat pumps is, you know, leaving your window open in the winter is never fun. <laughs> yeah. I, I will definitely sign up for being able to control my heat. In the winter, I would you pay an extra hundred bucks a month? Um, 
<laughs> That's a good question. Um. <laughs> But like, you wouldn't even be able to really make that determination, right? You'd be like, here's this apartment that's like this square footage and like it has this thing. Like, I feel like that's the way you can build it in. It's because customers really have no idea. what Right. If you, like, if you can think about how much your rent is and if that's being worked in there, then you probably don't even notice, I feel like. <laughs> the landlord should, should reduce the rent if they're going from heat included to you pay your heat. Right. In theory. In theory. In theory. <laughs> in theory. <laughs> in theory. <laughs> uh, Duncan, were there any other questions in the uh, in the in the in the chat that you picked up on, or or maybe even anyone out there who threw one out into the chat and uh, you know didn't feel it was addressed that wants to jump in? I'm not seeing any any different ones. I'll, I'll, I'll throw one out there. Um, going back to the like winter peak conversation, you know, you see a lot of interest in um, what the wholesale kind of generation level peak will be. I also think about with heat pumps um, and EVs as well, if there will be local peaks created that are problematic on the distribution grid at the feeder level, at the larger distribution grid level, transmission zone level, like there's, <laughs> there's all the levels, right? Um, but how we how we think about that, like I think about in New York City, like the B BQDM program, right? We did this really innovative, cool thing to prevent having to build a substation. Um, if we electrify all those apartments, are we just going to like blow through that? Um, and do we need to do more cool, innovative things to deal with that? Um, or or are distribution grids usually not sort of the weakest link in the chain? I think it, it okay, so um, it, this is kind of related to something we're looking at recently because of um, a lot of people are working from home, most people are working from home, and especially with the summer season coming up, um, there were concerns about, well, there were some um, hypothesis about whether just people being home and increasing that um, energy consumption on certain feeders, would that be a problem? Um, obviously, it's not going to be as big of a scale compared to if we just make sure everyone is using electric heat in New York City. I think that's a very different scale. But um, I do think the going forward in terms of, I think that's why you're seeing more utilities looking at integrated distribution planning beyond like the resource planning side. And I think that's something, it is a concern, especially when it comes to what, you know, specific resources, what feeders, what um, transformers or substations are actually facing pressure and what we need to do with it. Um, and I do think there is a disconnect um, because of, historical silos. Um, the operation side, the operations teams that look at, you know, the, your distribution management system, your distribution automation, um, very much your traditional like ITOT setup in at the utilities versus the customer programs that are encouraging people to adopt more energy efficiency, demand response programs, um, managed EV charging, and more flexibility, especially on the customer side. And the OT op operations, depending on what utilities, they, what you know, challenges they're facing, um, they're might, they might be seeing a lot more distributed solar coming online. And that's what pushed them over the line saying, okay, we need to have better situational awareness. We need to have better visibility of what's going on behind the meter, quote unquote. Um, but honestly, the I can, I mean, I'm, we have quite a few utilities people here. My, the sense I get is the operations team doesn't really care about exactly what's going on behind the meter. They have no interest. They don't have their expertise. They don't really understand what's going on out there. What they need is an aggregated level of demand forecasting and figuring out the locational situational awareness available to the OT team. And they're like, okay, we, that's all we need. We don't need so many more details. So that's, 
I think if you want to throw more acronyms here, the distributed energy resource system, um, distributed energy resource management system, DERM systems, that's where it comes in to connect the operation side and the actual like customer side resources. And that term has been thrown around and talked about and everyone says they have a DERM solution, but that's, you know, there are different types there. Um, but I, I, we are seeing more utilities being interested in this beca precisely because of locational issues. So I think building electrification could be part of that, that pushes um, utilities to think about, you know, the uh, more granular analysis instead of just at system level. And for example, like the demand response programs tradition, still to this day, most of them are pretty much all system level. They don't really concern specific locational value. But um, if you look at some, if you look at a utility like Arizona Public Service, which has a lot of solar on the grid, and you look at their demand response program, they are looking at locational value. They're looking at absorbing solar generation during the day using the batteries, using water heaters to address that really severe duck curve they have. Um, but I think the tipping point for utilities are still going to be probably distributed solar that's going to affect their power quality. Two is EV charging because that's not something that's seasonal that's going to be a daily challenge for them. Um, yeah, so anyway, I just saw a hand up, Ethan. Go ahead. <laughs> well, I, I just wanted to um, connect back to the question of when, when, when there's some financial value about it, when it actually becomes an issue on the grid, um, there's, there's still a gap here of controlling these things, right? I mean, mostly we're not talking about, you go down to the south and we've got central systems of, you know, heat pumps that are using 24 volt thermostats. And so you slap a nest or an ecobee on it or whatever, and like, fine, go ahead and plug that into your germs and you're great. But what we're talking about mostly here in the Northeast and in the short term are dockless mini splits. And they have these stupid IR controllers that don't have internet connections on them. They don't talk to the traditional 24 volt systems. So you can't retrofit them. And so you're left with Sensibo or Flare Puck or like some other janky system. And it seems to me like there's this huge gap right now. And I'm trying to figure out like who is leading the discussion on um, new standards for bringing these things into some kind of a useful ecosystem because there's like proprietary systems that are super expensive and no one's using them. And then, you know, some very like niche boutique smart home stuff that again, no one's using. So if we're trying to scale these things up, how the hell are we going to control them? Like we got to, you know, you, you, you should be putting in the controls when you put in the product. Yes, I ideally, but I think, in terms of utility uh, control part, it's almost always playing catch up to what customers have already adopted. Um, I guess in, in this instance, I would say, um, I think Energy Hub, um, I don't know if you're familiar with them. They're probably the one example I can think of that's been successful because they have figured out a way to work with manufacturers. And um, I think they're, partnership ecosystem has expanded over the last few years. And it's to figure out a way to work with these manufacturers and uh, for, for them to more easily sign up customers to for controlling and monitoring and optimization purposes. And that's, I think they figured out a niche there. And that is absolutely needed because you don't, when, when you're working with a utility program, you don't want to have to create a separate protocol or process with every other device you're trying to incorporate. Um, I think that's something they have figured out really exclusively focusing on smart thermostats for a while. Um, I think Sensible might be part of that mix as well in terms of um, integration. But yeah, that's, so that's it, you're absolutely right. Like it, ideally when we install something, hopefully it's, it, it's, you know, has something like open ADR, but that's kind of very much the foundational layer. Um, and it doesn't provide you with, my understanding is it doesn't provide you with as granular data and control that you would actually want to for a really advanced system. So yeah, that's, that's definitely a problem. But I, I think again, coming back to the energy hub example, 
they work with a lot of manufacturers, but they're also, I think, moving towards um, because they are able to, because of the customer um, touch points they have, they can actually aggregate a lot of data, they can provide locational analysis, and I think that's going to be valuable for kind of the operation side of utilities, um, if the utilities are facing those challenges. Otherwise, they just have data that no one is asking them for yet. I think you're right that, that Sensibo is a pretty, pretty crude solution because it doesn't actually have like real two-way communication with the device. And so it, it's pretty limited about what it can control. Um, I, I will say as a, as a side note that if you can figure out a good connected controls, if, if anyone is out here doing these kind of projects, there's a secondary benefit because if you're not pulling the fossil fuel central heating system out and a lot of the cold climate work that you know is going in retrofit systems, you leave in the fossil system for your, you know, negative 10 degree day or, or whatever, you know, so when your capacity can't quite handle it because it's way more cost effective to put in a smaller system and let the fossil take the last 10 hours a year. If you don't have connected controls, the evaluations out there show that most people don't use them correctly and our engineering models of how much, uh, you know, CO2 savings we're going to get from shifting all the load to the heat pump is completely blown away by the fact that people don't actually freaking use them and so we're just building load in the summertime and we're not actually offsetting any natural gas. And so all of our pretty graphs about, you know, curves going up to the right, it's just imaginary. So connected controls is also at the core of getting the things to take most of the load. Oh, by the way, then we can control them for grid peak. I could not make behind this more just by the way. Just... I was just gonna say Conad's tried to solve this for AC. I, I like participated in their smart AC program last year. And yeah, they ended. ship you like this. It's plug. gone. Yeah. It's gone. Well, I, I hope it, I'm I a participant too. <laughs> I thought it was cool, but I didn't really use it. The reward system didn't quite like shift me away from doing it right. And so I, I think that, that that's super important. They definitely need yeah. to figure that out. Um, have something similar for heat pumps, obviously. And I think going back to one of the things I mentioned uh, in the presentation, um, having that, like one of the standards that people are trying to install, the CTA 2045, um, especially for water years, um, with that Washington State decision and more manufacturers taking up on that, you will have a lot of controllable assets that you can activate essentially. So you don't have to you know, add on a retrofit to your water heater and to um, optimize usage there. So that's that's a small piece of the pie, but um, I think that's one example. Again, it, it does require, I, I do think the standards take so long to develop and we know they work. It's just no one wants to do it and it's very frustrating. Um, so it does require policy push and requirements to and that, that's what happened with a lot of the Energy Star products and really the, the bulk of you know, energy efficiency movement in California, it's, a lot of it is due to advanced like appliance standards as well. Um, but yeah, so it, it, it is some, some of that is happening, but the connection control definitely, uh, the majority of it has, has, is not there yet. I think Duncan just said he needs to jump off. Yeah, Duncan's gone. Hi, Duncan. <laughs> um, yeah, I, I just wanted to add like one sort of quick response. I guess Duncan, it was to his I, original I question. Well, Colleen, I, might, I might make you the host, but I guess. Okay, excellent. Yeah, you can make me the host. Um, yeah, I think there'll be like a lot of interesting things, like I think to the point of the length of time, right? Like New York State is going to be doing a statewide evaluation of all these new heat pumps that results will be coming out in 2022. So <laughs> we got, <laughs> got a little bit of time before that happens. Um, but the controls thing is like, I think a that Ethan mentioned is huge. Um, different network, like I know that there is a lot of talk on with the for between the forecasting and non-wires teams to try and coordinate and understand things. I think the question is like how quickly you can get heat pumps built into the forecast and then figure out what your reduction needs to be in those areas. But I think we're at time. Any final questions, burning, burning thoughts? Continue the conversation in the Slack. Um, yeah. 
Yes, I do, I do need to join the Slack channel. Faye, join the Slack so that people can ask some <laughs> questions. <laughs> <laughs> Will do. And yeah, thank you for, for having me to present yeah. and talk about building electrification. I'm this sure. This is great. <laughs> thank you so much for joining us. Um, yeah, and so I think um, more to come. We'll have another meetup in another month. In the meantime, let's keep the conversation going. Uh, Slack, Twitter, everyone knows where to find us. And thanks again, Faye. This was wonderful. Yeah, thank you. All right. See you guys soon. Bye. And thanks, everybody, for yeah, the questions. Bye.